Hey everyone, this is Pete Perusik, and I want to welcome you to this edition of the Weathered Athlete Podcast, a place for us to honor those athletes that refuse to go quietly into the night. As a weathering triathlete and a physical therapist, I will spend my time talking with those athletes that continue to make the necessary repairs and continue to move forward. They may have a few cracks in their foundation or a squeaky step, and their patinas may continue to fade, but they are no less glorious than years prior. In fact, I feel they have more heart and resolve as they have weathered and can provide the pathway to set the standard that we should all live by. My goal is to determine what sets these individuals apart from the rest of society. After the discussion is over, I encourage you to stick around and hear a breakdown from a physical therapist's perspective of how this weathering athlete is able to keep moving forward. Don't forget to hit subscribe, leave a comment, and share with your friends. Today, I'm honored to be joined by Deirdre Wonick from L number 13. I'm so appreciative that Deidre was willing to take time out of her busy schedule to talk to me. I discovered her story while searching the internet for climbers over 60. As I continued to do research, I was amazed that she climbed El Capitan at age 66, and then her son is Alex Honnold from the documentary Free Solo. I encourage anyone listening, parent or not, to listen to two podcasts she completed, the first one called Raising to Rise with Guy Michelin, and the other called Finding Mastery with Dr. Michael Gervais. She is the author of A Sharp End of Life, A Mother Story. All three of these provide great insight into Deirdre the person, the things she has overcome personally, and what it was like to raise Alex as a child, and how that upbringing helped influence all their successes. I hope you enjoy our conversation. I know all the focus has been on on Alex, so I'd like to really take some time and focus on the things that you've done, um, which is pretty cool but obviously uh, we can't not talk about Alex (laughs) if if it weren't for him I wouldn't be doing this either so you know we'll keep him in the picture yeah that's good so well I I appreciate you uh taking time to appear with me on the weathered athlete podcast sure thanks for inviting me oh you're welcome so as I was trying to figure out kind of what direction on this because you know this is the weathered athlete podcast my focus is on athletes over the age of 50 and basically on what they do to keep themselves active, how they, what they do for injury prevention and recovery from whatever events they're doing. Um, so, you know, obviously, like we said, you know, everybody knows you because of, because of Alex um, because of the movie. Yeah, and, because of the movie. and the movie Free Solo. Yes. Which we have to talk. I do have to ask as a parent, I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. I, I just, yeah. it, well, so, so was I, <laughs> <laughs> even though we knew the result, it's still Imagine. one of the, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. It doesn't change anything. No, it it doesn't. Um, the other thing that um, I'm good at now with this podcast is I give out homework. So um, <laughs> the homework that I'm going to give out to everybody before um, I actually publish this event or this uh, podcast is going to be one your book, which is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, read it cover to cover. Actually finished it two days ago. Um, so it was fantastic. I appreciate it. And then um, your, I listened to two podcasts that you did. Raising yeah. to Rise with Guy Michelin was incredible. Yeah, yeah and, he was a really good interviewer for parents, you know. For uh, Yeah, it was a fun interview. Yeah, I loved it. And I wish I had it 20 years ago. Um, yeah, right. Me too. <laughs> yeah. I have a 24-year-old son and a 20-year-old son. And my second one was... Not as active as uh, as Alex, but he was pretty active and enough that my father banned him from climbing any trees in the whole state of New York when he was little. <laughs> okay, sounds familiar. <laughs> yes, so I wonder what he would have been if that wouldn't have uh, if we would have told him no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to tell people like that no, it really is, and it, it's counterproductive. <laughs> it is. My, my father is like, no one's getting hurt on my watch. That was the biggest thing that he had. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one was Finding Mastery with uh, Dr. Michael Gervais. Oh, another excellent interview. Yeah, he's a really good good, good guy to uh, talk with. Yeah, so I think they pretty much handle, one, the raising of Alex, and then I think a lot of the things that you went through, which I think is, is, is incredible. So I'm definitely going to recommend both of those to my audience. So I kind of see this as like part four <laughs> to, yeah, okay. to things. Moving um, on. Okay. Yeah. So how would... I guess what I'm going to do is I want to start off with a with a quote, if you don't mind, and then we can kind of build from there. Um, this was actually a quote that 
I read, I think it's attributed to Alex, and it said it's not about controlling your fear. It's about broadening, broadening your comfort zone. You need to systematically expose yourself to something until it's not scary. Amen to that. Well, yeah. 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 So it kind of ties into then a, a quote that, um, that you had in the book that says, he has no idea how far outside my comfort zone he takes me and how hard it is for me to go where he goes, but I go. I, my mind is emptied in everything but the next foothold or handhold. Mm -hmm. how, how does that kind of attribute your life, I guess, to everything you've done? So what's your question? So, so my question was, I guess let's go to the, the, the first one as far as, you know, stepping outside your comfort zone. I think so many people don't step outside their comfort zone. They kind of stay yeah. Um, yeah. And, and not push their boundaries. So how has that quote alone kind of, because I'm sure he got it from you. How has that dictated your life? Well, it wasn't a quote back then, you know, yeah. it was just how we thought, you know, but all three of us. Um, it's always sort of been my guiding light, if you will, or whatever you want to call that, a mantra or, you know, focal idea, um, even, you know, since I was little, but I was forced to abandon it for many decades because because of how things were. But um, yeah, we've all sort of bought into that, you know, the three of us. And it's, it's really, um, like I said at the beginning, I, amen to that. Yeah. If, you can, if you can actually do that, life is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> it really is wonderful and, and enriching and, and, and satisfying and, and, and all that stuff. And if you can't buy into that, you'll be comfortable. Yeah. And nothing else, you know, not nothing, obviously, you know, there are moments in everyone's life, but, but yeah, that, that is sort of a guiding princ principle to um, accomplishing anything really in yeah. life, anything worth having, worth having done. Yeah. So then when you start, cause you started uh, running what in your mid fifties, I think I read. Yeah. 55. Okay. Yeah. And then, so it was Stacia that helped start that, correct? Um, it was both of them, really. It was, I got most of my encouragement from her because she's a runner, you yeah. know. So I would tell her, oh, I went running for an hour change. And she, oh, yeah, yay, mommy. And, you know, <laughs> talk about that. And, and yes, she was, was a major encourager of this. But um, I don't know if I would have continued with it had Alex not done that very first run with me. Okay. You know, I, that's in the book. You have to yeah. read the, you know, I, I hope you remember it. Yeah. Um, you know, the run to feed the hungry. Yep. I don't know that I would have, I probably would have done it, but I probably wouldn't have finished without him there. Okay. I, and I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. I, I, I doubt that I would have, but maybe I just would have dug deep and pushed myself anyway. But I was so glad to have him there holding my shirt and waiting for me and <laughs> cheering me on and, and waiting, you know, he, listening to, to i listened to his stories about spain he had just gotten back from spain that the night before and he told me stories all the way down it was six you know it's a 10k 6.2 yeah. i had never gone more than like two or three miles and i and i knew you know quote unquote i knew i couldn't because i i, I had trouble breathing you know i grew up in a cloud of smoke for yeah. 20 years so um if he had been there and telling me all these fascinating stories i might not have been distracted enough to <laughs> from all my pain and my discomfort to, to actually finish so i don't know but so i owe it to both of them you know equally yeah that's great so then uh transition from that so when did you kind of move your way up to like the half and then when was that first marathon after that um yeah i how did that go i i just it, i I discovered something about myself that day, and I kept wanting to push it a little bit more and a little okay. bit more. So I, you know, I did more 10Ks, and I did more 5Ks. I did, did a 12K, and then I figured <laughs> yeah, I'd push it a little more. And then I started playing around with that idea of doing a, a half marathon. Obviously, I couldn't do a whole marathon. Yeah. You know, that, that was still my headspace. Yeah. And, and that takes a long time to cure that, you know? Yeah. A lot of small strides in life to cure that, and so I, I signed up for a half marathon. And it was it was a disaster, and it was pouring rain and windy, and it was a terrible day, and it was hot. But I finished it, yeah. and that that kind of 
unleashed things. <laughs> After that, I knew I was a runner, you know, yeah. until that point, I was, I, I, I was just mom out there having <laughs> fun. But after that, I considered myself a real runner. I, I don't run fast, you know, I'll yeah. never run fast, um, but uh, I run the distance and that was my goal, you know, to do th for the endurance. Yeah. And it just took off from there. Yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing when you look at um, all the other runners that are out there and you see all ages and shapes and sizes and things. And I think people have this misconception exactly. that marathon runners are all young and that they're going to all do sub three hour marathons. Yeah. Well, where do you where do you think that comes from? Then? Yeah. Media. Yeah. If you open the climbing or a running magazine, all you see is young, perfect bodies. Yeah. They don't show you the 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 overweight people in the back who are finishing the marathon. They don't show you the grandmas, you know, who are finishing this and that. And, and it's a shame. And that, that's a, a just a little aside there, but I'm yeah. the new um, senior spokesperson for La Sportiva. I and love it. Is, yeah. This is happening as we speak. You know, we're figuring out what this is going to consist of. Okay. So I'll be interviewing th these outstanding you know, older senior athletes that are out there like me, you know, who started in their golden years or whatever you want to call it. And, and it's time. I mean, it's more than time. They're, they're, they don't have a face in the media, yeah. which is, which is a sin. I mean, they, they really don't have a presence or a face or a voice in the media. And I'm starting out, I'm going to be that face and voice and get them out there. Awesome. I, that's yeah, why this, really, since I started this project, this has been the best thing that I've done. I've been so excited. I've talked my oldest person was a 90 year old who still plays uh -huh. tennis two uh -huh. days a week. And I think yeah. you're right. Uh -huh. So those stories have to be told. And I think yes. people need to see that. People don't know. Yeah. People don't know because that's not what's out there on, on the covers of the magazine. Yeah. yeah it's a shame. So when you've, uh, as you've aged, you've what, done four uh, marathons, I believe. Um, what time frame went? When was the last one you did that? How long ago? Do you um, think? The last one was a few years ago. Let's see, 20, I can't remember. I'd have to yeah. go look at the medal. the medal that's hanging on the wall. <laughs> but um, maybe 2010. Okay. Like but I, I, then I sort of gradually moved, moved more into climbing and okay. traveling to climb. And then I had surgery on my foot and I've been sidelined for two years. Okay. So it was a while back. So how did that, um, like your recovery from when the running, so they've been in your 50s. How were you after you did the marathon? Did you take a long time to recover from those? or? I was absolutely fine. Okay. I had trained so much. I mean, this is, I believe this is the key to success in anything. Yeah. Anything at all. The, su the success comes from over preparation. Yeah. And I had trained and I, I knew, you know, how old I was and I knew I was new to all this and, and I really wasn't an athlete yet in my own mind, you know? And so I trained, I set up a schedule, you know, I, I, I didn't have a lot of time to train. You, a lot of your questions you sent me dealt with training and stuff. Yeah. I didn't have any time to myself to train. I was doing too many things. I've had many, many jobs and I was alone for my entire marriage and I raised mm -hmm. those kids by myself and and i did all kinds of jobs i was a tour guide and a professor and i was an orchestra conductor and yeah <laughs> all of them very very time consuming so i had no discretionary time to just train my body i that was out of the question i just went and ran yeah but i i set up i went online and found some what i guess they call them schedule marathon training schedules or something like that and i, I looked at those i studied them and and i studied them to find out how how uh what's the word i'm talking uh, how they approached how th how they incrementalized the the learning the training you yeah. know and um and then i looked at my life and you know i couldn't follow their schedule because uh, all of all my jobs so i i'm i tweaked it and tweaked it and 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 made it work for me and i did that for like 18 20 weeks or whatever it was so i was so trained yeah. and so it was like uh, I like that quote you started with from Alex, you get, you push your comfort zone yeah. until it, it's no longer scary. You know, when I went to that first marathon, I knew I was going to finish. Yeah. Darn it. I had already gone 25 miles or whatever it was, you know, in my training schedule. I knew. Yeah. And, and so afterwards I was fine. I was just fine. I, ironically though, when my son did his first marathon, yeah. this world athlete, 
he was wrecked afterwards because <laughs> he didn't train for it. He just figured, oh, I'm in good enough shape because you know, they go running all over the mountains and stuff yeah. as, as training, you know. Well, it was an eye opener for him. And I, I laughed and laughed because <laughs> I was fine after my four marathons, but he was a wreck. <laughs> yeah, there's something called training intensity, I think, too, you know, right. Right. <laughs> intensity yeah. of the event. So did you run walk any of those marathons or did you? All, all the Oh, okay. I always run walk. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 69 years yeah. old. I always run walk, and uh, I always will. It's, I find it, um, what's the word, a, a restful way to do the yeah. distance, you know. And I, uh, I don't go fast, but I keep going. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the important part. That's good. So, did you have a set uh, schedule as far as your run walk? How many minutes did you run? How many minutes did you walk? Um, do you remember? It, depend- yeah, it depended where I was. Sometimes. Okay and one sometimes three and two sometimes one and one depending you know where i was on the day and and the distance Uh, i adjust uh, according to how i feel basically okay yeah that i think that's excellent i think that's the the best thing i think we i had sent you an email the other day that i ran 52 miles on saturday and i just did a one minute run walk the whole way and there's there's advantages to to that to know what your limitations are right exactly Exactly. Um, so that's good what your goal is the goal is speed that's not going to work (laughs) no your goal is endurance that's excellent advice yeah um so how have i guess stacia and uh alex both i know they've they've pushed you to do more how have they do they take your age into account or just like come on mom let's go you can do this nobody (laughs) ever took my age into account um no they, they never um it never came up yeah it just never came up not because we were trying to yeah. not take it it just never came up i it, it was a non-issue um they gave me all kinds of advice about training and shoes and you know or, you know what's good to buy or, or use and i did i got very little coaching from alex because he was always gone yeah and he was all over the world on climbs on expeditions with the north base and you know, you know so once a year or so we would come back through the house and I, I, I would have stockpiled all my questions for him. Yeah. And while he was running around, you know, unpacking, repacking, <laughs> sorting gear, I would ask him some questions, but I didn't get much in terms of, you know, training from him. And uh, every time I saw my daughter, my daughter lives in Portland, so I don't see her that often anymore. But um, whenever we get together, we, we usually go running. Yeah. She's very really encouraging. And uh, so a little bit. Okay. Now, how about strength training or yoga or stretching or anything? Do you do any of that stuff? Um, stretching is very important. Um, stretching is, I can't stress that enough. It's yeah. very important. Um, the, the rest of it, I just don't have time. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. just don't have time. You know, I have, you know, books coming out or I had books that I was promoting and I write articles and I, I just don't have time. So I can, it's always a choice for me. I can either go do the thing, you know, go out and run. Or I can train at home. I'd always rather go out and run or climb, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. So in the book, you detail excellent how you kind of started your climbing career, you know, just going with Alex um, when he was injured. Um, yeah. So yeah. how were that first day you went up there? Was it just one of those things that you just felt like, OK, this is where I need to be and this is what I, I get what he how long did it take to kind of get what he does? Well, that very first time it was in the gym, yeah. you know, climbing. And uh, I had had no, I, I had I had already forgotten my childhood. Okay, mm-hmm. let's um, we'll come back to that. But yeah. but um, I had no uh, goals for that day. I just wanted to get acquainted with the gear, see how they did what they do. Because I hadn't. He would he would go on these trips and and come back. You know, like from Borneo, he'd come back with pictures and show me in, in what they did, where they did it and i had no clue what he was talking about because <laughs> it's a very specialized vocabulary for yeah. climbing very specialized jargon and he tried to teach me what the terms meant but i was hopeless because i had nothing to pin it on i had no experience to pin that on and with you know i'm a language teacher i've been a language teacher all my life i know that context is everything if you have no experience to pin something on it's not going to stick with you you know yeah. and so he he would despair of my memory. It wasn't my memory. It was my, my experience base. So I just wanted to go there for the day and get acquainted with the terms and how he did what he did. As it turned out, that's not how it worked out. Um, 
uh, I think I did like 12 climbs that day, 12 walls in the gym from yeah. everything from five, six to like five, 12. I tried everything. I, cause I had no idea what it meant. You know, yeah. I just tried everything. He pointed me at the wall and I'd go climb it. <laughs> and, and I loved it. I had worried because I know I'm, I, one of those, you know, no's in quotes. I knew quote unquote, that I was afraid of heights because, yeah. you know, I've been, I've been, I'm from New York city. I've been in many, many skyscrapers and whenever I'd look out the window <laughs> or, you know, mm. the railing, I would get that feeling in the pit of my stomach, you know? So, so I knew quote unquote, I was afraid of heights. So somebody like that can't climb. Right. Yeah. You know, and all my friends tell me this, you know, my colleagues at work, they would all say, Oh, I could never do what you do do. Cause I'm afraid of heights. Everybody says that, but what they don't, understand is they're not afraid of the height they're afraid of falling off that height yeah so once i put on that rope and realized this you know in a visceral way as i was going up that first wall i was like yes this is great yeah. <laughs> and then i remembered how much i loved it when i was a kid yeah. when i was like four and five and six i used to follow all the little boys and we'd go up trees and lampposts and, and garage <laughs> roofs and things like this and i loved it but i everybody yelled at me you know yeah. i was supposed to be a little girl and wear dresses and behave myself and that was not <laughs> behaving myself so i gave it up and i forgot all about it but i always loved it and this just brought it back yeah yeah it's amazing so doing you know 12 it, I, I did some rock climbing um inside i've only been in, on a wall i used to live in phoenix and we would go every day after work or i mean once a week after work and we would all go climb and and, you know, I was in my 20s, but, you know, as being in your 20s, it's brute strength and you pull yourself right, up. Right. And the next thing after right. like three, my arms are are right. done. And then well, you... that's, a, that's, that's a guy thing. It is. It's... Women don't do that. Nope. Women don't do that. Yeah, not at all. And that's why I was just so one of the women I was with, they'd keep climbing because they would use the technique. They would right. one their right. flexibility was better than mine. Right. And right. so. I learned fairly quickly that I needed to improve my technique and I, I didn't do it for probably more than about six months, I think at the time that I've done it a few times with my kids, but you're right. Technique is, is, is so important. Yeah. Well, women don't have the, the upper, upper body brute strength, so they don't start out depending on that, but, yeah. but men figure I can power my way up this one. Yeah. yeah it's, it's an advantage and a disadvantage you know, not to have that brute strength. Yeah. So then when you transition to, to out, you know, climbing outdoors, how was that first time out there as far as just getting over again, that fear of that so-called fear of heights of being outdoors, you know, gym is one thing, you know, you're secure outside, even though you're still roped in. How, how was that? It was that? terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> it was absolutely terrifying. And this is another area where that, you know, Alex's quote that you started with yeah. comes into play. I had to talk to myself in my head constantly that first day and, yeah. and really, really yell at myself <laughs> 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 that whole day. And, and to the other, you know, the other folks who were out there, my, my new friends, they're running around and jumping around <laughs> without ropes. And, and I was terrified, but I, I never let on, you know, I never yeah. let any, maybe they could see, I don't know, maybe I was super focused, but, um, I, I just did whatever they told me and, and, you know, sucked it up and, you know, breathe deep and yeah. try it, you know, and, and then the second time was easier and the third time was easier. And, and then we, then we did a multi-pitch climb yeah. <laughs> and I discovered real terror, <laughs> you know, but again, that, that was another day where I just talked to myself the whole day, you know, and, you know, kept telling myself, okay, they're all doing this. They're not afraid. <laughs> yeah. That one doesn't even have a rope on. And we're up here at 200 feet on this little ledge, you know, and I kept talking to myself and, and kind of calming myself down. But that's that's what Alex means by, you know, getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, the more you do it, the easier it gets, obviously, like anything in life. Yeah. So now you've been, what, about 11 years, I think you've been climbing. Is that about right? Thank you. Ten years. Ten years. So how now, obviously, you still probably have some of those feelings occasionally, but are you able to brush them off quicker? Uh, yes. Yes. I, I can talk to myself in a more succinct fashion now. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. I, yeah. We Last month, I think it was, I went up to Yosemite with, with a fr friend who lives in uh, Mariposa. And he said, oh, oh yeah, we're, I'm, I'm going to show you this great place. We're going to go do the top of the rostrum. 
Do you know what that is? The no. Rostrum? Well, the rostrum is it's it's a freestanding tower, not freestanding. It's attached to the wall, but it's semi freestanding tower in Yosemite Valley. It goes up like two thousand feet, and um, it's it's a big uh, name in Alex's history. You know, uh -huh. um, in Yosemite, and I think he free sold it. Yeah, he free sold it and made history. And you know, and it's it's huge. Yeah, <laughs> and the way we did it you drive up to the top and it's separated from the wall so there you go you wrap down one pitch and then you're in like a gully and then you climb up the uh, the pitch on the tower okay well when we walked out to the the land side you know where the car was we walked out hiked out to the top where we would start wrapping down i looked about and you know the, the two guys i was with they're hopping all over these <laughs> these black abysses and jumping over <laughs> holes and and you know setting up ropes and, and i was i was absolutely paralyzed yeah i just watched them do that from a safe distance because yeah. <laughs> i haven't climbed in like seven months now with covid and yeah. with my foot and stuff and so i hadn't been out there in a very long time yeah um, and if it's true if you don't use it you lose it you yeah. know and so i watched them do that and there's a dude come over here let's take a picture <laughs> oh. so i'm thinking oh, okay how can i refuse this nicely <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so while they were doing their thing fixing ropes and anchors and stuff i i kind of sidled out to the edge of this thing and stepped over one of these holes you know the uh, not a hole but a, a cleft you know yeah. the rock and like, so deep that you can't see it it's just black uh. you don't want to fall into it because you go down and down and so yeah. so, so i and then i eased myself out there a little bit and then back and then out and then back and by the time they were set up and ready to take a picture i had gotten out there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's you know it's little by little baby steps baby steps yeah it does get it does get easier and but i still work on it <laughs> yeah um you know one of the things that i was supposed to do uh santa rosa 70.3 in may and it was canceled because of covid so we had a four-day trip to yosemite so um living vicariously reading through your book and looking at stuff and looking at the picture as i have in my background here because i hate the fact that i didn't get out there to really see it uh-huh uh-huh yeah, so I, I I appreciate the detail. I still don't know what it all means, but uh, I'll, I'll figure it out eventually. One of these days, huh? Yeah. So one of the things I, I from reading the book, I, I guess most people don't realize, and I, I believe I didn't realize, is that you have to work to get to any oh. of these climbs. This is not like oh, you just yeah. pull in the parking lot and it's right there. No, no. The, the hardest, worst one that I've done with Al, it's sort of like seven, eight miles hiking. And that's what does me in. <laughs> yeah. And then you have to start climbing after that. And then you have to hike back out. Most people, um, a lot of climbers, uh, they hike out and then sleep. Yeah. You know, they, they spend the night there. But Alex is not like that. <laughs> <laughs> when you go with Alex, you go very fast. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he holds his speed records on everything. Go, go, go. Yeah. You know? So, you know, we've never done it that way. Not even on El Cap. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll get to that in a minute because I look at the just the, the time frame. It's basically it's an endurance yeah. event. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That then the the run the running marathons helped me uh, in my basic my basic training my base training for this yeah. kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it's all endurance. It really is. So the running right now, you're still doing some. How are you training for that? Those hikes? You just, I guess, the more you climb, that consider that's part of your training of, of doing the hiking. Um, well, running, of course, trains you for hiking. Yeah. You know, and uh, train uh, hiking trains you for hiking. I, I go yeah. whenever I can. And, okay. Um, so it's just kind of they all feed each other, kind of. In okay. Terms of, you know, and uh, each. Uh, when I was training for El Cap, for example, the hike, the hike to the climb that we did is outrageous. You're hanging on the edges of things. There are fixed ropes because it's so dangerous. I couldn't get out there. Okay. You know, I tried several times um, while I was training on my own. You know, I tried several times just just to see what the base of the climb was like. I couldn't get there. <laughs> okay. That doesn't bode well for the climber. <laughs> no, no, you got to get there first. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and yeah, that that was that was a big concern for me, just getting to the climb and getting down. 
was an even bigger concern because that's really rough stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it's in the dark most of the time. So obviously you want to yeah. get there to climb during the day. And obviously, depending on how long it takes, you're climbing back in the dark. Right, right. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was treacherous. <laughs> So as far as uh, nutrition then, again, I'm going to view this as an endurance sport. Uh, how, did, how long did it take you to kind of figure out your nutrition for these um, events? Um, well, the marathon training helped there. Yeah. Because, you, know, uh, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of training, and I've done four marathons, you know, lots and lots of training. Uh, so I had, I had time to experiment to see what would fuel me the best. You know? Yeah. And everybody is different. You know, you have to do it yourself. You, you can't go by what somebody else is the perfect fuel. Um, so I experimented, you know, several years running to see what would fuel me the best and last the longest and how often I needed to do that and all that stuff. So, yeah, that was, that was and of course, all the, all the, all the multi pitch uh, climbs that I did with my own friends here in Sacramento, not in Sacramento, but, you know, my friends from here, yeah. we would go up to the, the, the Sierra you know, on weekends. You know, we were all weekend climbers and we would do multi-pitch climbs. And that's where I really worked out, you know, what kind of fuel I need, how much, how often, because some of it was trial. It was all trial and error. And I made some spectacular errors and yeah. I'll never do that again. <laughs> yeah, because you can't get stuck halfway up and not have right. any energy. Right. right, exactly. Yeah, you in climb in running they call that bonking. Yeah. You, know, you hit the wall. Yeah. And I hit the wall in climbing once or twice and I will never do that again. <laughs> yeah. It, it's tough. So what do you do? You just have to just wait your time out then. Well you have to carry I always have to carry food with me. Okay. You know? My pockets are always filled with food. Uh, something I can just whip out and pop in my mouth, you know, and uh my backpack is always filled with more serious food, you know, like a sandwich or something, or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I learned that the hard way. I did get stuck on a on a while well, I was leading a climb, and, and I bumped, totally bumped. I was shaking, and I couldn't I couldn't think clearly, you know, yeah. couldn't do anything. And I had to be rescued. So wow. yeah, I'll never do that again. <laughs> well, yeah, that's one of the things I, I loved about the book, as you said, you basically got stuff shoved in every pocket. Right, right, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> So then, um, two things. I, I so I want to talk about June third, two thousand seventeen, the day you heard yeah. that he climbed. Uh, what a day! Yeah. <laughs> what a day! I was with him the day before. Me okay. and uh, two friends of ours from France, and uh, we hung out with him the whole day before in Yosemite. We went hiking and you know eating and picnicking and biking, and he never said a word. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but that's him. You know, he never said a word. He didn't want me to know. You know. Yeah. He's always had the foresight to never let me know about any of his free solos beforehand. And I was always grateful for that. When I started learning what free solo meant, you know, years ago, yeah. and I started seeing what he was doing in the magazines and on video, I was so grateful to him for having made that choice. Yeah. And he probably made that choice for him mostly because he you know, needs his mind to be clear. Doesn't need to know that mom's home saying the rosary. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, I, you know, anyway. So, so I was always grateful to him for making that choice. Yeah, that, that that's good. Yeah. yeah. So the, the day then that you went to to uh, do El Cap, um, how early in the morning did you start that day? Five o'clock. Okay. Five o'clock. We were at the wall. You know, we did that horrible approach in the dark <laughs> using the ropes. I used the ropes. The, the guys didn't. I did. Um, you know, the fixed ropes to get up these horrible, blocky, ledgy things. But anyway, we got to the start of the climb at, um, I guess, 630, you know, about an hour and a half. It it shouldn't have taken that long, but I, I, had, yeah. and I had done it several times prior, but I had never done it in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that's one thing I didn't train for was the darkness. Yeah, you know, I did. I did come down um, just because things happened that way. I did wind up coming down. I, I practiced going up and down all, all the fixed ropes that are on El Cap. You know, I did that for many weeks, and I did wind up coming down those ropes the, that we were going to be coming down um, in the dark once. But the ropes are only half of the the, the descent. <laughs> okay. So, so when, and when I got that half, I was comfortable. I knew, what I, you know, I knew I could do it in the dark, but 
not the rest. So it took us an hour and a half to get, you know, to the base of the climb. And then the guides, you know, they decided to sort gear and, and suit up and, you know, get their harnesses ready and stuff. So we, Alex started climbing at seven. Okay. Okay. And then you reached the top at what time? 13 hours later. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. 13 hours later, 13 nonstop go, go, go hours later. Yeah. So one of the things, so as far as like your nutrition and stuff during that, I know Alex, again, mm-hmm. you described pretty good. So Alex climbs, sets things up and then, so you have some time to rest in between the pitches. Well, no, I would not call it resting. Okay. Because you're hanging on the side <laughs> of it. There's no place to put your feet. You know, you hang, they were all hanging boys. Okay. I did, maybe one had a, le- a tiny ledge, you know, but they were all hanging boys and they were all, supremely exposed okay you know and 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 i had although i knew what i was doing when i was doing it that day i wasn't alone you know because i had trained by myself and so i knew what i was doing and i knew i could do it but once i got to each um belay station there were like sixty three thousand clips and (laughs) rope and stuff attached (laughs) to all those two two uh bolts yeah and so i i had to step and study okay i can't clip over this one because they're going to take it off first i can't clip under this one because that's dangerous i can't you know oh, by the time God. i would figure it all out alex would just grab my stuff and clip it in and go <laughs> and, and so I, yeah i i did have time in i had t- time enough at each relay station to watch him climb the next pitch but I couldn't take my backpack off because we were hanging on the side of the wall. I couldn't take my backpack off to get my food. Yeah. And I could, you know, like I have a little sports beans and stuff in my pocket. And I could get, I could get one of those out and pop it in my mouth. But but I had to really pay attention. Yeah. I mean, this, this is life and death stuff. Yeah. And I had to really pay attention. And boy, did I pay attention. Yeah. And so, so no, I never had time to rest. I never did. Uh, I could drink some water. But okay. I... That was about all. So 13 hours of really not much nutrition. Right. When we got to, there's a ledge, a big, big ledge that goes across the whole wall called Thanksgiving Ledge. Um, It's like two thirds of the way. It's two or three pitches down from the top. So you're almost there. Yeah. And that, that was, uh, I was giving thanks for sure. Yeah. (laughs) there are rocks it's a big big ledge you can camp there and you know set up there and there are rocks uh, that little toilet stop in the back of the, all these rocks and, and okay i could sit down and eat a few bites of my sandwich you know and i did but mostly i was terrified and i yeah. was too terrified to eat and alex alex took off his harness at that point you know he's so comfortable up there and i'm not <laughs> <laughs> So I'm watching these two guys. They're not even roped up anymore. And they're running around this ledge and putting this here and this there. And, and, and Alex is like a little kid up there. He, that's where he comes alive. And he kept saying, Mom, come over here. Look at this view. Mom, come over here. Look at this view. And I just wanted to be tied in again, you know, with another rope and leave me alone. Yeah. I was busy processing. It was a hard moment. Yeah. But I did get to eat a little bit there. And that's all the food I had on that day. Wow, that's a, that's amazing to me because you know when you're doing an event that long, is you you think about it, um, because you're basically using your arms and legs, so it's jumaring right where you're kind of yes. going up. Yes. So the whole right. time, I mean, it's nonstop work. It's nonstop physical work, heavy duty physical work. And fortunately, I had trained enough so that I could. By the time I I left the Thanksgiving ledge, though, I was done. Yeah, I still had the three more pitches to go, and we had to go down, and I, but. I was done. I was worked. I was, I had nothing left. Yeah. I had, so I ate, you know, like I said, I ate a bit of my sandwich there and I tried to calm down. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I kept asking him questions that took the focus out of my own head. Yeah. Asking him questions about this and that. And and he kept saying, Mom, come look at this. And he's hanging over the edge. (laughs) Mom, look at this view. (laughs) No, thank you. Yeah. And, And then I knew I had to find, a little more you know, yeah to get the remaining three pitches and the remaining three pitches were really really hard i i couldn't just jumar up i had to wrap my arm around the rope and, and use my elbow and alex kept shouting down no don't hold the rope <laughs> and i kept shouting back i have to <laughs> <laughs> he didn't he just doesn't he doesn't understand such weakness yeah you know? 
he really doesn't. It's just a, over his head completely. Yeah. But but he was very patient and he, he waited for me. We made it. So those pitches, how long, um, I, since I'm not a climber, how long is a pitch usually? Or is it very? Well, is it about the same? The first pitch was about 200 feet. Okay. And that's kind of, kind of typical. Okay. We went about 2,000 and a quarter feet. Okay. 2,200 feet total because the, the approach takes you up pretty high. So we started at about 800 feet okay. of 3,000, you know. So um, divide that by, I don't know, I, actually, I don't know how many pitches we did. Okay. But, uh, about 2,250 feet. Okay, yeah, I was just trying to figure out distance. So, you know, if you had three left, you had about 600 feet or so, yeah, give yeah, or take yeah. a little bit to, to just yeah. get up, just somehow find a way to dig deep and get it done and get up there. Exactly, exactly. So it was dark when you got up there, or was it light still at that point? It was starting, you know, the sun had gone beyond, it's behind, okay, you know, behind the mountains. And it was starting to dim out, you know, by the time I got, to, and another, uh, there was a big surprise for me at the top in that I I didn't realize, um, and I'm not very good at reading topo maps and, and understanding what that means in terms of physical limitations or whatever. So there were a series of um, uh, slabs, I guess you call them, series of slabby rock formations that you have to go over at the top. And they have ropes on them. It's not actually part of the climb. Okay. It was for me, though. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I got to those, and it was dark by then. Okay. And then, but I, and I, so it was dark, so I didn't want to take off my back uh, for fear of, of dropping something, losing something. And I didn't want, and my shoes, I had climbing shoes with me in my backpack, but I didn't want to take the time and effort to put them on. Yeah. It would have slowed us down a lot. And so I just kept going and going and yelling at him, Alex, I can't do this. Alex, <laughs> and he just kept being very patient. So I got to the top. That's great. Yeah. So you didn't have time to just to, uh, to say, yeah. wow, I did it. Because it's not done until no, you get no. to the car. Exactly. We didn't have time to savor anything. I got to the top. He turned on his uh, headlamp. I turned on my headlamp and we started marching because you have to cross all of the top of El Cap before okay. you come down. Okay. And it's like a mile, it's like a mile and a half. Okay. And it's, and it's a mile and a half tilted. Um, and I, all I could think of was don't go near the edge. Yeah. Don't go near the edge. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it was pitch dark. I couldn't tell where the edge was, but he knew. And, yeah, and I just followed him, and he kept saying, "Oh no, it's fifty yards over the, that side. We're fine." And I kept saying, "Oh good," and I followed him some more. But it's really rough terrain up there. It's it's like ice in yeah. a lot of spots, and it's there's all kinds of boulders and trees and prickly stuff to, to deal with. It was it was hard. <laughs> yeah. So how long did it take you to recover from that? Um. Again, like my marathons, I had trained so much that it didn't take me. We got down like at two in the morning back okay. to our house that we were staying in in the valley and went to bed immediately, collapsed. And I think I was up like at eight or nine the next morning and I was fine. Okay. I, was fine. I, I expected to be wrecked, you know. But yeah. I had trained enough that, again, it all comes down to over preparation. Good. And that's the the key to just about everything in life you know no matter what you're trying to achieve or accomplish if you over prepare for it when it actually happens it's kind of uh, anti you know yeah i was i was absolutely fine i drove home the next morning four great. hour drive yeah i was fine that's great you think about that length of time and everything that you did oh, you would expect yeah. again that stairs would not be your friend right, right. <laughs> i was very surprised you know. So thinking back on, I'm sure you've had definitely lots of time to reflect about that. Um, anything you would change at this point, or just just an amazing day? Oh, change about that day? Yeah. Um, not really, not really. Yeah. It was like it was like, it, uh, truly an amazing day in every aspect. <laughs> yeah. I still can't get over that we did that, and I, I still can't get over that I did it in one day. Yeah. You know, I was willing even eager to spend a night up there on a portal ledge, you know, yeah. but Alex doesn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you have to carry all that stuff. You got to carry water. You have to carry a stove. You got to have a portal ledge. And then you have to haul all that stuff behind you. And, oh, it's so slow. And he doesn't go slowly. <laughs> 
So yeah. So when we got down, his his then girlfriend, who's now his wife, yeah, uh, she had made a, a dinner, a big dinner at two in the morning. Yeah. And so we got in, we ate a hot meal, and then we went to bed. And uh, that's how he prefers to do things. Yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't change a thing. No. That's awesome. And then, so the night before, how are you for sleep before something like that or any of the events? Do you get a good night's sleep or do you I think do. about things? I, I, I always sleep well. Um, good. I, that's a gift, I guess. I'm, I'm always grateful for that, you know. Uh, yeah, that particular night, it probably took me a little longer to fall asleep because I was, you know, thinking about all the concerns I had and, you know, what concerned me the most was coming down. Yeah. And, uh, uh and I had I had gone up the entire way on the descent ledges and the descent ropes. Yeah. Um, but when I did that with my friends, they all kept they allowed me to use a, a short. They kept me on a short rope, you know, okay. for all the ledgy parts of it. Yeah. Alex did not. Yeah. <laughs> Alex did not. He wasn't going to uncoil the entire rope so that I could do that. Um, it was too much work. It would have taken too much time. So he just helped or verbally helped me, you know, you know get my find my way down yeah so did you know you were the oldest woman to to oh, summit i did not know that until months and months later really you know? okay yeah my friend my friend um our friend hans florin uh you know he's mr mr el cap you okay. know he's done he's done the nose like 110 times or something like that he he's a friend and i was at his he has a gym in the bay area a climbing gym and i yeah. was there and we were talking about it and he he mentioned he said i i think you're the oldest woman to ever do that and so uh, I was, you know, mildly intrigued. Yeah. Because age, age is meaningless to me. It, yeah. it always was even when I was a kid. Age is just a number. And um, so he said, I'll find out. And sure enough, he did find out. Uh, I was the oldest by a decade. Wow. Yeah. You know, I'm, technically I did not actually climb it yeah. as climbers. That. You know, I jumared the whole thing. Yeah. I didn't have my hands on the rock. I had my feet on the rock, but not yeah. my hands. So a lot of climbers say, well, you didn't really climb it, you know, but, uh, you know, if you look, look up climb in the dictionary, <laughs> that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to agree with you. You started at the bottom, you got to the top. Right, so right, exactly. yeah, Alex exactly. didn't pull you up. You did it. No, no. <laughs> <he did not. laughs> so, um, who are those people you kind of rely on? For what? what I, I, so, um, so as far as, you know, uh, um, you're climbing and running, obviously, I know Alex and Stacia are probably your biggest influences. Who yeah. else do you have that kind of helps you get through kind of those struggles, I guess, as a as a climber at age 66 trying to do this? Do you have other friends that you kind of lean on? Uh, I wouldn't say lean on, but we talk. Um, yeah. My friend Mark, uh, he, he was sort of my mentor. He was my very first um I'm not partner again, but yeah, he's the first person I approached when, when I got up the courage to go back to the climbing gym alone after Alex you know, had left on another trip. I, I wanted to go back and I wanted to go back, but I was afraid to, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anybody, you know? So one day, like six months later, I got up the courage and went back to the gym and um, didn't know anybody. Uh, I finally figured out how to put the harness on. It was, yeah. a, it was tough. <laughs> And I'm wandering around thinking, huh, how can I climb? You have to have a partner. You know? So uh, so I looked around for groups of three. And, you know, groups of three, two are, you know, climbing and playing yeah. and the other one's waiting. You know, so so I, I found Mark that way. He was waiting and I said, oh, would you like a belay? <laughs> <laughs> and he did. And we became friends. So he, he's um, older than me. Okay. And um, larger and, uh, and larger than life. He's a big guy, six five, and uh, and he's well, I think five years older than me. Okay. And uh, so this didn't mean anything. Like I said, age is meaningless to me. It yeah. Always has been. However, it seemed to me to be different if for men and for women how old you were. You know, yeah. if I didn't see or know or meet a single woman in my age bracket who was doing this. And I never thought anything about that. It's true. That's their loss. You know, yeah. <laughs> they weren't they were out there with it. That's their loss. Uh, so I never thought about age, even with Mark, you know, he was older, but he had all, kind of, all kinds of health issues. And so we talk about that, but those were his health issues, not yeah. mine. And, you know, so, so he's been a very, um, 
regular, reliable um, source of information and, and raw, raw kind of source, you know. Okay. Uh, and I have one other climbing partner, a, a, a years long climbing partner here in Sacramento that she and I go out once in a while, but um, not really anybody else. I, I just myself and my kids and yeah and i made friends uh, i started taking my climbing out into the world you know i went to climbing in the northeast you know uh, new york and new hampshire and i went to france and greece and a lot of places and made friends in those places too so yeah but they're not local so i can't go with them a lot you know yeah i, I the reason i ask is i i you know alex and stacia they're they're young vibrant yes they're they're going to help you get to where you need to be but i think there's a benefit of having people kind of in the same, not, I won't say demographic, but kind of doing the same things that, you know, our mind is willing, but the body sometimes is not as able. Right. Exactly. (laughs) I got a lot of that from Mark and we talked about those things and I could see what I have to look forward to, to put it that way. Um, and so that was good. That was, that was a good, um, uh, verbal experience space, if you want to call it that. Yeah. to hear those things i don't hear those things from anyone else because i don't know any older climbers who are women yeah yet or one or two but you know we don't get together they're not local so i don't get together and chat with them uh, so yeah it's it's i've had i've had to and i always have anyway totally discounted age yeah it's it's not a thing it's not a factor I I imagine it will get to be Uh, like, you know, I had surgery on my foot two years ago and I'm still, still feeling it. I'm still coming back. I've only recently been able to put on a climbing shoe. Okay. So yeah, I can see how that, you know, it'll take its toll eventually, but, but until it does, we're going to have lots of fun. (laughs) That's, that's good. You know, you just, you learn to adapt and you just change maybe your technique again. That's where I think it's so important, the technique and, Right. Um, you know, you can't muscle through stuff anymore, but you can definitely right. still do it and get that, around it, do an end run. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I've noticed from the, all the interviews I've done so far is that I think everybody's got that same attitude. It, it ages. It's not, they don't even, no one focuses on it. even the 90 yeah. year old. It's just, it's a matter of just, I'm going to get up and do what I can today. And I'll worry about that as it happens, you know? Exactly. Exactly. So what are, um, I guess, what else can you attribute to some of your success to? Uh, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a big question. Tenacity. That's yeah. a biggie. Um, uh, yeah. Let me, yeah. Over preparation is probably the best okay. advice I can give anybody about anything, okay. whether it's teaching or climbing or running a marathon or whatever it is getting a new job over prepare and yeah. then you'll be so comfortable with it that it you know the hard stuff won't matter anymore or okay. as much so the over preparation is the basic most important advice tenacity um that's baby steps yeah a lot of people don't think they say oh i could never do that but could you do this? You know, yeah. and then this, and you know, you you know, when you're a kid and you only need to tie your shoe, you don't just make a beautiful bow the first time. You learn to make a loop, and then you make 96 different loops, and then you know you learn how. So baby steps. Anybody, Alec has you know uh, mentioned this many times in interviews, and and it's always been his credo that anybody can do anything. Yeah, if they have enough baby steps in the process and if they want to badly enough so you just you know baby steps keep putting one foot in front of the other and then and the baby steps will accumulate into a base of tenacity that will get you up that rock yeah and the yeah the third thing would be to have and this is pretty important and usually gets glossed over but to have concrete goals Mm -hmm. that you can put down on paper you can say it in an elevator somewhere, 25 words or less, I am going to, mm. Mm. and because you won't reach your so-called goals if you don't make them concrete. Yeah. You know, people dream about things. My mother was like this. She used to dream about writing a book. Oh, I'm going to this. And, oh, I'm going to that. It's going to be beautiful. But she never did it. And and that was a big lesson to me when I, I was a little kid. I, yeah. I used to, li- to listen to all her stories. It was going to be glorious. It was going to be this, that, 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 that. She never did it. She, you know, she died. Yeah. So, so if you will not reach your goals, if you don't write them down and make them concrete, yeah, you know, 
So that's a very important step. That's a very important first step. You know, you can dream about something, but it's not going to happen unless you make it concrete. Yeah. And yeah. then start over preparing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I also saw, you know, I, I started journaling probably about three weeks ago, yeah. you know, and I've always journaled in my head. And then, uh-huh. you know, actually, I've heard it from many people, but you are, I know you're a big proponent of it too. And yeah. I'll be awesome. honest, it, it's incredible by actually just putting it down. I make a point to do it every day. Good, good. Oh, yeah. It's the best shrink in the world. It, it the is. It's the best shrink in the world. And so many people have never even heard of it. You know, it's yeah. really, a, they should teach it in school. Yeah. Students would do so much better. It, it, you know, this, it comes down to metacognition, you know, yeah. knowing, know, know thyself, you know. Yeah. And that's what a journal can allow, allow you to do. Yeah, I think it, it's good, you know, and again, putting those goals down. So every day I put down what my goal is for the next day. And uh-huh. so you're right. It, it's it's amazing how much that kind of keeps you focused and on task. Right. right, exactly. Too easy to be distracted right now. Yeah. Oh, goodness. With all the screens. Yeah. Little, little screens, the big screens and all yeah. the politics and the, the, yeah. the oh, God, yeah, you have to you have to focus. Yeah. So I think we already uh, touched on it, but I'll ask again, as far as mantras, um, I, we've kind of, I know we touched upon some of like your quotes and Alex's quote in the beginning. Any other mantras you have or anything else you just keep telling yourself? Um, well, yeah, I got a lot of them, but um, <laughs> basically we've covered it. I'm, yeah. To write down a concrete goal and to work toward it step by baby step. You know, you can do anything that way. And and sometimes you'll lose sight of it. And sometimes it'll get overrun by life and other stuff. But if you write it in your journal, for example, you can always go back to it and then revisit it and then bring it up again. And the journaling is very important. I yeah. would not have survived my, my miserable marriage without that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. I don't know. Did that answer that question? Yeah, before? yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, because we touched upon it, so I, you know, we pretty much had answered it. But um, then, lastly, because I don't want to keep you uh, much longer, so I, I use I use a hashtag my miles are four as a way to kind of reinforce why I do things. You know, I had a childhood friend die of cancer when I was in high school, and I had a friend die uh, four years ago. And, you know, it's just kind of every day, whether it's miles in life or miles for me running and cycling and everything. How about for you? What What are your miles? What is, do you have anything in particular that means? Uh, yeah, I always I enjoy accomplishing things. I get immense satisfaction from you know, accomplishing something. Mm-hmm. It kind of completes me, if you will. Uh, and that satisfaction uh, grows you know each time you do another one it's it's it, it, it inc- the satisfaction increases exponentially you could yeah. say you know? and i do these things these, these i set these goals because eventually i know they will make me happy and satisfied maybe not at the moment while i'm doing it <laughs> you know when i'm running yeah. a marathon i'm pretty miserable <laughs> <laughs> but i know that you know uh, a la longue as they say uh, in the long in the long run, <laughs> ironically, um, I'm, it's going to make me a lot happier and feel. It's a sad, It's a kind of. It's a kind of satisfaction that you you have to experience to understand. You know, they talk about the runner's high and all that stuff. I, I used to poo poo all that. that. That's just silly. That's just hype, you know. Yeah. But it is definitely not hype. Definitely not. So um, I don't know when it is in September, but happy birthday sometime this oh, month. Thank you. That, that was last week. Yeah. Well, happy birthday! And then I, I did see that you've um you pretty much always do a a climb with Alex. Um, but with COVID, well, what do, are you gonna do? I do, but we did not not this year because of COVID, and and they just got married and they were at Tahoe instead of Yosemite. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to Yosemite in, in three days, and I'm gonna probably do some climbing. I hope. Um, and at the end of October, uh, every every year, I go, go back to Yosemite to get get on some of those ropes again and do a little jumaring on El Cap. Okay. It's my anniversary, you know, anniversary of my climb. Our climb was on uh, Halloween Day. Yeah. I see. On Halloween Day, we did Lurking Fear. <laughs> <laughs> was was that uh, planned on purpose? No, no, just <laughs> well, no. He picked the climb. I had no, no idea what we were going to do. Okay. I just asked 
who get me up El Cap and, and people should read the book and get yeah. a real feel for what it was like to be on El Cap when you're not really a great climber. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm giving everybody homework. They're going to have some homework to do um, to read and then also listen to some of the other stuff. And so tell me a little bit more, I guess, about your um, your project now that you're doing. So you said you're going to oh, be, rep- okay. yeah, tell me about that a little okay. bit. Well, I, I approached uh, La Sportiva. La Sportiva is one of Alex's sponsors, so I kind of know them. You know, I know who they are, what they do, their, their goals and stuff. So I approached La Sportiva with my idea of uh, what I mentioned before, um, seniors. There are a lot of seniors out there doing outrageous things out in the outdoors. Um, but a lot of seniors don't know that they can do that. Because I, I did a book tour last year with my when my book came out, and I spoke at a lot of senior centers. And I did a slideshow of, you know, my experiences out there. And um, oh, often a lot of them would come up afterwards and grab my hand and shake my hand. And some of them would cry and they'd say things. Oh, I didn't know I, we get, I could do that or that or how easy it was to get out there. And, you know, they just don't know. Yeah. And it's not in the magazine. That is not in the media. And all the media. I was astounded the other day. I don't watch television. I don't have a television. I haven't had a television in, I don't know. 20, 30 years, something like that. So I'm out of touch. So I went to somebody's house and they had the television on. It was a cable, cable TV, of course. And I was absolutely blown away. Every commercial break, they were touting drugs. Yeah. Every one. A drug for this disease, a drug for that disease. Talk to your doctor, get this drug because it'll make your life better. Every break was a, a, you know, drugs. I was absolutely astounded that 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 is allowed yeah and um they seniors need to get off the drugs off the couch and out into nature and nature is such a good healer it's yeah. the best healer and it's been replaced by these drugs that they tell yeah. big pharma and so our goal is to get them off the couch and out into the outdoors even if it's just walking you know bird watching it's, it's wonderful um and so that's that was my goal. And they thought it was a wonderful idea. And so I'm their new senior spokesperson and I will be doing a, probably a blog at their site. I'll be doing magazine articles and stuff, you know, interviews and things. Okay, cool. So how can people find, find that? Um, well, they can, there are several ways they can check out the La Sportiva site. Okay. Um, and they can check out my um, Instagram account, you know, my name in what do you call that sign the, yeah <laughs> the number sign yeah uh, pound sign whatever it is deirdre wallenick okay you'll have to tell you'll have to explain how to spell it yeah. <laughs> i'm sorry it's a very hard name both of them <laughs> i had nothing to do with that yeah. <laughs> um so my instagram account or they can follow my facebook account they're basically the same okay um, and so they can keep in touch that way, or they can write me, you know, my last name at Gmail. That's fine too. Okay. And I'm happy to keep in touch with them. And of course, tell 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 everybody if they know a senior who has started um, an outdoor activity in their senior years, not somebody who's been doing it all their lives, but yeah. who like in their fifties and sixties or or higher went out and started an outdoor activity. Put them in touch with me, or okay. you know, tell them to get in touch with me. I'd be happy to do an interview with them. And, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Excellent. I'll go ahead and put all that stuff in the show notes, and okay. then okay. that way we'll have connection to all that. And uh, Deirdre, thank you so much for taking time with me. I appreciate it. Sure. Thanks for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. We're able to gain some insight into how one weathering athlete approaches each day of training and racing to stay as injury free as possible. I believe her biggest strength is her tenacity and her willingness to over-prepare for everything in life. Her enthusiasm for learning and pushing boundaries is evident and had been clearly passed on to her children, Alex and Stacia. I learned that climbing is an endurance sport. Contrary to belief, there is not a parking lot at the base of any of these climbs. Most of them require multiple mile hikes over varied terrain to get to and return from any climb. Her round trip climb at El Capitan at age 66 included 13 hours of physical climbing as well as a strenuous hike to the base and then hike back down off the mountain, both of them in the dark. Because any climber will state, a climb is not over until you return to the car. As an endurance athlete, I am in awe of the level of physical fitness that is required to complete a full day of climbing. 
Deidre states that she entered into a relationship with La Sportiva and will be highlighting individuals that have started their athletic careers later in life, so stay tuned. She can be contacted on Instagram and Facebook, and I highly recommend you purchase her book. I encourage everyone to check out some of the great things Stacia is doing as well. She has a blog, carfreerambles.org. And honestly, Alex is everywhere, so you'll ha- all you have to do is Google his name, but I highly recommend Free Solo. All the links can be found in the show notes. Thank you for taking time in your busy schedule. If you find today's or any other episode inspiring, I ask you to consider to join our patron program. Details can be found at www.weatheredathlete.com. Also, please don't forget to hit subscribe to this podcast, share with your friends, give me a rating on iTunes, leave me a comment or drop me a line if you feel what you have what it takes to enter the Weathered Athlete Podcast. Lastly, no matter how you complete your miles, I encourage you to use the following hashtag, my miles are four, as a way to reinforce the purpose of those miles. As always, my miles are for the journey. People are sick.